Welcome everybody, and thanks for being here on Skane's Domain. Um, my name is Adam Meeks, and I'm the video producer at Gazette Lincoln Center. Um, and tonight will actually be the final episode of Skane's Domain before a summer break of sorts. Um, we'll be back in September to dive back in. And in the meantime, we'll be launching a variety of exciting new summer programs and ways to remain connected to the music. Um, so please keep an eye out on our website and social media pages uh, for these new summer programs. Um, tonight, Winston is joined by a collection of some of the world's foremost trumpet players to discuss legendary trumpeter Lou Soloff and tell stories. We'll hear from John Faddis, Randy Brecker, Earl Gardner, Michael Rodriguez, Kenny Rampton, Marcus Prinup, Sergei Nakarayakov, Ryan Kaiser, Greg Gispert, Alex Sipiagin, and Dave Taylor. In a minute, I'll hand it over to Winston, our special guest for the evening, and later on we'll conclude with a Q&A portion, and I'll give instructions on how to ask a question once we get to that point. So without further ado, Mr. Winton Marsalis, take it away. Okay, thank you so much, Adam. Thanks everybody for joining us. You know what we say every week, we like to discuss uh, issues significant and trivial, and with more passion as the issue is more trivial. But this week, we're talking about one of our very greatest colleagues, a uh, great brass player, and I want to say Dave Taylor is not a trumpet player. He's one of the most fantastic bass trombonists and trombonists in the world. We're joined by royalty, brass royalty, um, all trumpet players, brass players who play the instruments on such a high level. Young genius of the trumpet, Sergei Nakarayakov, is in Paris. So they're saying it's past his bedtime, but he's going to stay up to talk about our fantastic colleague um, that passed away a few years ago, the great Lou Soloff. Any of us that played with him or knew him, he filled us with the type of collegial uh, spirit and feeling of joy and love that we always want to experience again and again. The level of his trumpet playing, his musicianship, his engagement with music, the way he showed love to younger and older musicians, how he would go out and hear people, the way he would sit and listen to others play. He was the very model of citizenship as a musician. So I'm not going to go on and on because we have a lot of great musicians to hear from. And believe me, everyone up here, plays the hell out of their horn. We're gonna start with a master who is, a, who was how I was introduced to Lou was through this man. Uh, he doesn't need it, his playing needs no introduction, but he's gonna tell us some fantastic stories, Mr. John Faddis. Thank you, Wenton, and hello everyone. Uh, Lou Soloff was my best friend for many, many, many years. When I first came to New York, it was Lou Soloff that took me under his wing and taught me how to read. I didn't know. <laughs> but he would pull out things from Stravinsky, which I had never seen. Stravinsky, something for two trumpets. And I would I'd, I'd look at it, and it was like in a totally different language than I was accustomed to. We became best friends. We shared a very similar sense of humor. <laughs> I would say that it was all love and joy, because Lou was the type of person that was focused on one thing, Lou. Earl Gardner can tell you a little bit later, Randy Brecker can tell you a little bit later about how Lou lost privileges for the trumpet section, <laughs> the trumpet section by knocking over all four stools in Carnegie Hall during <laughs> And there was also, you know, Lou was, I don't think he had a, a, a a hateful bone in his body. I remember there was one person that that Lou didn't think had hurt him. And it was someone who would always uh, talk about people behind their backs and things. So Lou hired him for a gig because Lou was the contractor. And the following year when the band met again, this other guy was the contractor and Lou wasn't in the band anymore. <laughs> But Lou didn't hold that against him. You know, he might say, yeah, well, that's a drag. But his main focus was always the trumpet and music. And I remember being his roommate. And it would be, you know, he, <laughs> he when he was with Blood, Sweat, and Tears, he hired a decorator to decorate his apartment on 52nd Street. And they told him his basement was soundproof. Now, it wasn't soundproof. And Lou would be at four in the morning. Da 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 I would put my head under the pillow. Always practicing, always wanting to go better, the one, to get better. And the one thing I would say about Lou is as great as he was, 
he didn't always exhibit the confidence that his greatness allowed. He was very humble. And he would say to me, John, I can't play a double B flat. And I said, <laughs> and I'd say, that's because, Lou, of what you just said. If you say you can't do it, you can't do it. So here, just practice this soft and it'll be okay. And the next thing I know, he was at Carnegie Hall playing a tritone above the B flat, E above double C at the end of the piece. That was Lou. And I, I would say the happiest I ever saw him was after the birth of his daughters. He was just, he was just so happy. But he was also happy hearing great young trumpet players. He took me under his wing. He introduced me to Wenton. He introduced me to Sergei. Uh, he introduced, introduced me to Ryan Kaiser, uh, Ambrose, so many trumpet players. And he just loved trumpet. And he had about 40 trumpets in his collection, maybe more. And he would always say, man, you got to check out this. It's the greatest trumpet. And he'd get his horn up through it. And he'd take the horn out, and none of the valves would work because he hadn't picked it up in five years. <laughs> So Lou was one of the most <laughs> humble, loving, and kind human beings I ever met. And I, I think about him every day, and I miss him to this day. And um, turn it over to Randy Brecker, or is it Dave Taylor? Dave Taylor. Dave. <laughs> Dave Taylor. Uh, I echo everything John Fattis says. Uh, I met Lou Soloff on 7th Avenue. I think we were all hanging out with Billy Cobham. Alan Rubin introduced me to Lou, and he wanted us to be brothers, actually. And by the halfway across 7th Avenue, uh, we were already teasing each other, and it lasted for about 50 years. Um, Lou would always call my house, and I'd call him. We were on the phone probably literally three to four times a day, most days over the last 50, 40 years or so. I always, when I had students over, I always pretended that I was embarrassed that he would interrupt us and blah, blah, blah. The students loved it, but I was so proud uh, that Lou Solo called me. And uh, he taught me, I think, more about music after I got out of school than anybody. He introduced me to Fattis. Fattis and I and Lou were actually roommates on Thad Jones's band. And that was an insane situation. There was one time we had a suite together. It was my wife. And I on one side of the suite, Soloff and Fattis on the other side of the suite. I didn't improvise when I was in Thad's band. That, that language was unfamiliar to me at that time. I had come through a classical thing and I just joined Thad's band right out of school, blah, blah, blah. So Lou was always trying to get me to play. So here was one time in the house, in the apartment, in the suite that I started to play and he laughed at me. <laughs> and I jumped him, and I jumped him, and I started strangling him. And Fattis had to pull me off him. Uh, I guess it, it, it might have been all, it might have been all the game. I don't know. But uh, uh, we, when we were on the road, we had to invent a rule. It was like that Mandrake thing: no knives and no water, because we would hide behind doors. We would come in. We would, or I would come in. We would attack each other. We, we would lose accounts in New York. When I say accounts, I mean recording sessions and things like that because we would have water gun fights during the studio time. Um, <laughs> uh, I was on a road uh, with George Grunts' band and Lou. We were in Munich. We were in. Uh, oh, what's that city with the Reaper Bond? We were in. Um, yeah. We were at, we were How do I know that? <laughs> <laughs> it was me and Marcus Belgrave, rest his soul, Marcus Belgrave, and a couple of guys, and Luke got us into this place, and all we had to do was order a bottle of vodka, but the most important thing was to knock on the door and say, Wolfgang sent us, and that's what we did. We were in the brass quintet, um, Alan Rubin, Lou Soloff, myself, Peter Gordon, and a tuba player, great tuba player named Tony Price. We rehearsed for months. Um, we rented Carnegie Recital Hall. Alan cracked a joke during the first piece. Lou had mucus coming out of the notes and all the time. The concert was over. The concert was over uh, by that first tune. And that, everybody went home, and that was the end of that. Uh, <laughs> I actually had Fattis and Soloff on a piece by a woman named Lucia Lukaszewski at an all-women's convention. 
It was really a horrible thing because we got lost. I don't know if you remember this, John, but we got lost in the middle of the piece, and we kind of everybody started laughing, and we kind of she 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 forgave me, but this was in front of like a whole Hunter College kind of a thing. Um, Lou was into transcendental meditation, and he had a big alarm clock. It looked like the alarm clock looked like what Captain uh, Hook threw into the crocodiles. Uh, you know, it had those two bells on top. And he would be calm and peaceful for about 20 minutes. And all of a sudden, that thing bells to all hell would break loose. And he'd wrap it. And that would be the end of the thing. He took us, he wanted me to get involved in transcendental meditation. So he took me to a convention of about 400 people. We sat in the middle, of course. <clears throat> he said something to me. I said something to him. We started laughing. And they threw us out of the meeting. <laughs> and, but he kept on going to change, and that actually happened. I hate to say this, but at our dear friend Alan Rubin's mother's funeral, actually, uh, John and I were sitting next to each other, Tony Price and Lou, and it was like that Mary Tyler Moore thing where we all started breaking out laughing over nothing. You know what I mean? It was, but it, it was one of those horrific, sad, joyous things. Um, I got wrote something down here. There was one time, John, I don't know if you remember it, but both Alan and Lou were called by some big shot band and they were negotiating price. Then it had been Benny Goodman and you became Sid Bernstein and you, and you called up the management and started negotiating for the two of them. And after you negotiated and got the price up, neither of them accepted the job. <laughs> <laughs> and that, and I mean, I can go on and on about this whole thing, but I'll stop. I just have to say that I cried uh, the loss of, uh, of our friend because um, I think of him. I, I I think of him daily. He insisted that I stay in the music. When I wanted to leave a band, he insisted, don't leave the band, go back out on the road. He just wanted me to keep my head in the music. I was honored that he always wanted me to play bass to his lead. He loved Snooky Young. Snooky Young danced, Louie danced. And, and Louie danced is in my mind to this day, man. Just, God bless you, man. That's all. I don't want to get down on this thing. I want to stay up. Well, you know, you know, Dave, Winton plays a Monette trumpet. Didn't you meet a Mon Mr. <laughs> <laughs> Louis took me to, uh, again, we were, we were like children, you know. Louis took me to uh, Monette's factory in Chicago. And uh, Dave had a, um, a gong. It was a big empty room. And when he wanted you to start something going, he hit that gong, and then you're supposed to play the trumpet. That son of a bitch hit that gong. <laughs> I, took, I took off and jumped you right in the middle of that thing. And, started, <laughs> and we just started wrestling. On, we, we, we were children together. We wrestled. <laughs> <laughs> we just wrestled. Uh, Jill Evans, we were, we were throwing toilet paper at each other in the Munich airport. <laughs> and running around Gil Evans, running around Gil Evans. We, I mean, Gil Evans, man. We run around Gil Evans, run around Gil Evans, and finally we both stood up in front of Gil Evans. And Lou said, "Well, he started." And I said, "Well, he started. No, he started." <laughs> Jim said to us, "Well, you know, boys, you don't have to participate." <laughs> uh, I, I miss him. Oh, man. Yeah, man. I don't know. Who, who goes after me, man? I took up too okay, much we're going, time. We're going to Randy. We're going Randy. to me. No, All Dave. right. Those were great stories, guys, and I sure love Lou. Uh, he was such a close friend and such a character, but what a trumpet player. He could play anything. You know, before I came to New York, I think this was maybe two weeks before I was moving, I met the uh, pianist and uh, drummer, Barry Miles, and uh, at uh, uh, Phil Woods' uh, camp. This is back in 1965 or 1966. And I went over to Barry's house. He heard me play a little, and he played me a tape of his quintet, and it was a great trumpet player on there. And it turned out it was Lou. I said to myself, uh-oh, I'm going to compete with this. That's the first time I heard him. He was just incredible on this quintet tape that Barry Miles had. 
And, you know, I was thinking of it earlier. I don't remember the exact moment I met him, uh, but we were both, I, I re the first time in my recollection was uh, I had moved to New York. I was playing a lot at the Blue Note with uh, uh, Duke Pearson Big Band and Lou was still in the uh, National Guard. And I remember standing outside of the club. I think this was the first time I met him and he got the call to sub. He was off that night and he came in and subbed in the band, I think for uh, one of the cats, I think Marvin maybe. And I happened to be seated right in front of him because they couldn't fit all the four trumpets on the bandstand. And I forget <clears throat> the name of the tune, but this was one of the hardest tunes endurance wise. It wasn't even a lead part or a, or a, a solo part. It was just a long part with a lot of uh, notes with a not with not a lot of rest kind of uh, a solo within a solo or a solo within a soli and he just played just great man and i heard that sound right in my head and i looked around to the back and burt collins just looked at him like did you hear what he just played so that was my introduction i think to uh uh lose playing and late uh just by when he was in town he would play in a lot of the big bands as a sub I got to know him really well and just fell in love with the guy. There were so many stories beside his, besides his musicianship. We kind of gave each other lessons. When I left Blood, Sweat and Tears, I managed to talk him into taking my place. He had actually been previously called. I was with, uh, I left to join Horace Silver and I coerced Lou into taking my place. He didn't want to do it, really. He didn't want to play in a rock band. And uh, although it was uh, for what it was, we were getting paid every week, whether we worked or not, $100 a week, I told him, it's two $50 <laughs> gigs you don't have to do. So by the end of this rehearsal, we were rehearsal for Joe Henderson, big man. Oh, wow. I, had him, I had him talked into doing it. And uh, sure enough, uh, he joined the band. They went and I joined Horace Silver, 250 a week, 147.50 after he took taxes out. He didn't tell us we had to pay for our hotels when we worked. <laughs> Next thing I know, Blood, Sweat, and Tears went into the studio, did their second record uh, with Spinning Wheel, that great Lou Soloff classic solo on that tune, and all the other hits, Blood, Sweat, and Tears, number one for 52 weeks on the charts, <laughs> playing all the uh, spectrum, his salary skyrocketed, he bought the apartment, the two floors. You know, we were taking lessons with Edward Troidel, we would take a bus out to uh, New Jersey. <laughs> Uh, Lou started picking me up in a limo to go out to the <laughs> you know, cackling the whole time. He <laughs> take a limo back and forth to the lesson. But I wanted to, uh, what, a, what a character. He's everyone's straight man, you know. Uh, remember that time with the Carnegie Hall Big Band? I won't talk too long, just a couple of Carnegie Big Band stories. Yeah. Uh, Lou came out front and standing there with Fattis, and Fattis noticed his... Uh, his zipper was down on his pants. <laughs> and, you know, Lou turned around and zipped up and offered Fattis uh, his hand as a handshake. And Fattis was like, oh, <laughs> the whole audience. But <laughs> the classic one, now Fattis brought it up, but I was standing next to him. And then I'll turn this over was uh, the classic, uh, it was uh, all star cast playing uh, Dave Grusin's. West Side Story. Now the previous concert, I forget who was there, Lou managed to knock one stool off the riser, but it was in a part of the show where it was loud, but it wasn't that noticeable. Somebody was playing a solo, it was loud. So uh, we kind of all took it in stride. It was typical Lou. But the sec next concert had a string section, people in from LA, George Young was there from LA, uh, uh, Gloria Estefan was out front on stage. Uh, Dave Grusin kicked off the uh, the tune. It starts, booty bop, da da da. Grand pause, and I saw Lou out of the side of my eye, butting around. I was standing right next to him. The grand pause, two stools this time, crashed to the ground. In the grand pause, and, oh, and of course we kind of lost it, but uh, we kind of held our composure. He wanted, Dave wanted to go on, we start the thing. And that wasn't all. About five minutes later, I guess his music got stuck together. So he thought he was on page three, but he had actually turned to page five. And he came in with a long, high, blasting high note. 
in the complete wrong place. And at that point, at that point, we lost it. Then we lost it. One by one, we just collapsed. We kept going, though. And that wasn't all. And this one is hard to believe. I don't know how he managed to do this. But he had his piccolo on a stand right next to him. And somehow he got the piccolo trumpet up his pants leg. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. I don't know how he got so I had to hold him steady while he managed to lift up his leg, you know, lift up the leg, get the piccolo out of the pants leg and the, without knocking it over. And that was just one concert, guys. Oh. <laughs> so, I don't want to take oh, up man. too much time, but, you know, I think we're all familiar wow. with this, seeing Lou like this. One pair of glasses, two <laughs> pair of glasses on top, sometimes three. <laughs> so I don't want to talk too long. I have a whole list of stories, but uh, Lou was, you know, I said this at his... Uh, Memorial, you know, is so ironic. He died of a heart attack since he was really all heart. He was just all heart and soul. I know I speak for everyone. We miss him so much every day. All oh, these, I have a whole list of stories we could all talk for an hour or two hours about all the right. uh, little things he used to do. But I'd like to uh, turn it over to my Philly compatriot, Mr. Earl Gardner. So, <laughs> um, yeah, Randy. Thanks, Randy. Yeah, Randy. Um, I just, I don't, I, I don't remember when I actually officially met Lou, but I remember um, meeting, not meeting him, but seeing him in Philly with blood, sweat, and tears. And Randy, I, Randy, I remember this club, the Electric Factory, I think it was. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Electric the Factory. blood, sweat, and tears was playing there. And uh, I went uh, with a friend of mine we went to the club to hear them and they were on a break and I was kind of I was kind of running around the club and that's when I was huge I was like you know it's hard to miss me and um, I am running around the club looking for Lou I, I, I didn't know what I didn't really want to talk to him because I was too intimidated I just wanted to like be in his presence and I um, I remember walking around the club they were on a break and I just happened to right before they were getting ready to go up on stage I turned, um, I turned around and he was right there. I almost ran him over and he had this look on his face like, <laughs> and I was like, I was like it's Lou Soloff. And he was like, I was like, yeah. And he kind of shook hands with him and he was like, yeah, yeah. Uh, and split thinking like, I think he was, he was glad that I hadn't run him over and squashed yeah. him. So, but um, that's the first time I, I actually was in his presence. And then after I came to New York, I. I, I don't remember when we officially met, but uh, all I know is when when we got to know each other, it didn't take long. Like John was saying, he was kind of like he was like a he kind of took me under his wing. Like John kind of did the same thing to me too. Um, uh, and Lou was uh, just like the nicest guy and the craziest guy I've, I've ever met and one of the greatest trauma players I've ever met. I was, I was always in awe being in his presence. And when I actually getting a chance to play with him was, was just, um, I couldn't imagine it. Kind of like with all of you guys, <laughs> any chance I got to play with you guys, I was kind of, I was, I'd be sitting there like secretly thinking, I can't believe I'm sitting here next to Fattis. I can't believe I'm sitting here next to Randy. You know, it was just, it's like, it was like that, you know? Um, but one of my favorite, I've got a million Lou stories, and one one of my favorites was, it's kind of like with uh, the car. It's in the same Carnegie Hall theme. Uh, I think this is what John was talking about. Was we had this concert. I don't know what the concert was for or who it was with, who we were playing for. But before the concert, John gave the band, got the band together, and gave us a, a speech, which was directed at Lou. <laughs> but we had the whole band together. He didn't want to just single Lou out and say, like, Lou, you know, because every concert, Lou would knock over his mutes. It never failed. <laughs> At some point in the concert, his mutes would, would hit the floor. So John got the band together, and John, John was, uh, he told us, listen, this is a real important concert. We can't have any, we can't have, we can't mess, we can't mess this up. It's really important. There are people out there. And, um, you know, we got, we got to be on top of it. Like, like we can't have any dropping of mutes and stuff like that, you know, and, and the band, we're all standing there kind of 
you know, looking at John like, yeah, okay. And meanwhile, we're thinking, well, he, he's talking to Lou. And <laughs> we all knew that, but, you know, John was being, you know, John was like, yeah, I don't want to single Lou. I didn't want, he didn't want to come over. So, uh, so Lou's standing there and Lou being Lou is pretty much oblivious to what Sean's saying. He's off in Lou land, you know. So, <laughs> And we're all like, and we're all like, okay, cool. So I know that place. Band goes out. We walk out on stage. The audience applauds, and uh, then John comes out. He comes walking out. The audience applauds. And John gets the mic. He says, "Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we're, we're the Car Carnegie Hall Jazz Band, and uh, we're you know very happy to be here tonight. And um, we're we're gonna, the first tune we're going to play is." Um, uh, oh, meanwhile, Lou's got the mutes on his stool. Because normally he would knock the stool over, but he put his foot <laughs> on the stool. <coughs> and I'm, I'm just looking like, this is not going to go well. I, I just knew that this, that's, this isn't going to happen. And I'm asking Lou, I said, like, Lou, you think that's a good idea? And Lou's like, no, no, it's fine, it's fine. So John's introducing the first tune. And Lou's standing there being Lou. He's fussing around. He's got the mutes up there, but he's down in his he's down in his gig bag trying to get this. He's got his phone, blah, blah, blah. He's like, he's just, you know, Lou, Lou never could sit still. So John says, so the first thing is gonna the first thing we're gonna do is whatever it was. And Lou's standing there and he all of a sudden he stands up and he he uh, he moves over to the towards his stand towards his stool. And we're all like watching John, and all of a sudden we hear this crash. He had knocked over the he had knocked over his stool, and the mute fell down. <laughs> and we're and, and we're and we hear this, and we all look up like, oh shit! Pardon me. <laughs> and we look, at, and John John stands there, and he hears this crash, and he turns around, he looks at the trumpet, he looks at us, and I'm sitting there thinking. <coughs> John's gonna kill us all. He's just <clears throat> and Lou's still and Lou's still not. Uh, he's not aware that John's staring at us, and he's down there picking up his mutes. <laughs> and John's just standing there staring. And he looks, and Lou finally puts some mutes on his hand and, and and looks up and he sees John staring at us. And Lou's like like a deer with the head in in headlights, and and John just starts laughing. <laughs> <laughs> And it was just, it was perfect because we're all thinking John's going to explode. He, he gave us his big speech. And then as soon, before the concert starts, usually Lou would knock him over during the concert at some point. But this is before the concert starts, before the, <laughs> down the first tune. He knocks everything over. And John just started laughing. And Lou just, just Lou had this look on his face. And, he, and he, he's like, he looks at me, he's like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, just saying, I'm, I'm just looking at him like, Lou, I'm, I'm going to kill you. Because that was part of my job was to keep Lou, like to try to keep Lou in line, which was impossible to do. So we finished the first half of the concert. And we come back out the second half and all the trumpet, all the stools are gone. <laughs> so we get up there for the second half of the concert and we're standing, I'm going like, what happened to the stools? And Lou's like, I don't know. Where, where are they? I said, like, Lou, you got our school privileges taken away from us. <laughs> That's when I first met Mike Rodriguez. On that, he was Mike was subbing for Lou. Lou was doing something else. He was going to join the join the, the tour like after the first week or something. And after the at the end of the tour, we were recording the music and we were in Paris and we did this concert. We did this. Uh, we recorded this stuff and. There was this one tune. I forget what the what the name of the tune was, but there was this big long thing at the end. This this refrain, kind of like uh, April in Paris, but uh, not like the same, not that kind of thing. But it was just this long, like this long melody, uh, like just go up and up and up, and it goes up up to a high F sharp or something. And we recorded it, and Lou had a, everybody had separate entrances, and Lou kept coming in early on his entrance. And we, it wasn't like he was reading it. We had been doing this. We had been doing this for like three, four days. So we knew the part. We get to record it. We're recording it, and he comes in early. And I'm screaming. I'm holding this F sharp, and and he's coming in early. So okay, we gotta do it again. So we did it about. We did it. We must have done it by five or six times. And the first 
to four or five, the first three or four times, Lou kept coming in early. And I'm like, I was like, Lou, what's wrong with you? He goes, I don't, I don't know what, I don't know what's, what's going on. And like, I said like, well, you're, you're coming in wrong. That's what's going on. Like, uh, okay, I'm really sorry. So like the third time we do it, it's like, it's same thing. The fourth time you do it, same thing. And now I'm like, I'm starting to, I'm starting to die. The fifth time we do it, it's start, it's actually starting to feel, it's starting to feel better. And he looks at me, he goes like, well, you're starting to get warmed up now. And I'm looking at like, Lou, I, I don't, you need to get warmed up. It's like, you're, you're killing me here. But we finally got it done. And by the time after that thing, I was so pissed at him. I didn't speak to him for the next, for the last two or three days of the tour. He, so, and he was oblivious. We get back, we get to the airport together and we're going back on, we're going, he's going on a different flight, but we went to the airport together and I didn't say a word to him. I didn't speak to him the whole time. And like he, he left, I was going to say bye to him, but he, his flight left and, uh, and he went to, he was in a different terminal. So I didn't get a chance to say goodbye to him. So I didn't see him for, for about a couple months. And we, we were doing the Mangus band. It was one Thursday at the, at Iridium. And he comes walking and he was in, he was in Southern, not, not Southern, but he had gotten called for that week. And I hadn't seen him since, since we were over in Europe, since the Carl tour. So I'm setting my stuff up. So he comes walking in, I'm up on the bandstand and I see him come walking in and he looks up and I, I look at him and I see him and he comes walking up on the bandstand and he goes, are you mad at me? <laughs> <laughs> and I just looked at him and all I could do was start, and I just gave him this big hug. He goes like, he says, I thought you were mad at me. And then I told him, I said, well, Lou, I was mad at you because, and I told him what was why. And he just was, he's like, I, I had no idea. And I'm sitting there going like, how could you not have any idea? I didn't speak to you for the last three days of the tour. I didn't say one word to him. But that was Lou. Lou was just oblivious. And, but, you know, <coughs> couldn't stay mad at him. I mean, I could not stay mad at him. And he was just, he was incredible. And I just love him. And like, like Randy Day said, I miss, I miss him every day. And, um, you know, there are times that, Something will happen, and I'll I'll think. Oh, I wish I wish I could call Lou to you know tell him what just happened. So um, you know, sorry it's been so long, but that's all right. Thank you, Bert. <laughs> Thank you. So now we we got we got a, a young yeah, man that's this in Paris. He's been he's been staying up. It's two or three in the morning for him. I just want to say that the one thing about Lou is that he loved all the trumpet players. So if anybody played or he heard somebody, everybody knew about it. This next uh. Right. Trumpet player that's, that's going to talk. We f I first heard about him when he was 13 or 14. Lou said, man, if you heard this kid from Russia play uh, Moto Perpetuo, he had the record. He said, man, come in here and listen to this record. I was in his apartment. He put the record on. We were listening to all the records. And he was like, this is fantastic. He had the most loving collegial spirit. So I want. we're going to hear now from Mr. Sergei Nakarayakov. Um. Hello, everyone. Uh, for me, it's a great honor to be among all of you. Um, and many of you um, I met through Lou. So um, I feel very lucky, a very lucky person. Um, the first time I met Lou, it was um, probably at the end of uh, 90s or the, the year 2000. I was going to have a concert uh, in Long Island, I think, and uh, we agreed uh, to meet after a phone call. And she brought uh, many instruments and mouthpieces to the meeting. And I was very excited to show his stuff. And, uh, then he, he took this funny looking trumpet, which was a piccolo trumpet, but look, looked like an ordinary one, just much smaller. And he played absolutely perfectly, uh, apart from Brandenburg Concerto. I think my jaw dropped on the floor immediately. And uh, that was the beginning. And um, I must say that immediately uh, it felt like he was a very close uh, relative to me, a very, very warm person and like um, really like um, my uncle, I don't know. And I must say, um, I didn't really have an uncle with whom I would have such a uh, such a great contact. Um, 
and I used every opportunity afterwards to come to his concerts when he was coming to France uh, uh, during many years. And um, towards the end, I remember uh, I, I started to get quite worried for his health condition because somehow during that tour, it, it felt to me that he was very tired. And uh, when he told me his schedule, uh, I couldn't believe it, how hard um, it was. Um, and when I learned about his passing for me, it was a very tragic news and um, I'm, I miss him so much. Uh, like um, a very, very close family member. Yeah, sorry. Right. sorry, I don't, don't really have a, a very interesting story to tell, but... Beautiful. No, that's good, man. That, that's that's me, this is how it feels. Your presence is a story. You know, thank you for being here. Thank you for staying up. Thank you. Thank yeah, you man. So hey, Lou, Lou, Lou loved you. And we, we, go to, we go to see you play, man. You know, you came to New York. And he was calling everybody. Hey, man, we got to come, come here, our man. And you played fan, so fantastic, you know. So thank you for being here. So now we're going to, we're going to throw it over to Mr. Greg Gisbert. Uh, Hey, everybody. It's so great to see everybody and, and hear these great stories about Lou Soloff. Uh, he was a hero of mine from the time I started buying <laughs> records. I, if I saw Lou Soloff and John Faddis' name on a record, I, I didn't care what the record was. I had to buy it and listen to every trumpet part and try to figure it out. I finally got to meet Lou in New York, and he was so kind and gracious and so excited about the trumpet and music and just hilarious to be around. Well, after getting to meet him, about 10 years went by, and we showed up on a Mingus band gig together in California. And Lou looked at me, and I looked at Lou from, from toe to head, from bottom to top. We were wearing the same exact New Balance black tennis shoes, the same kind of black Levi's, a North Sea black T-shirt turned inside out so it would look like a black shirt, a black tux, a black tux coat the same kind and same strength reading glasses from the same 100 yen shop near the Blue Note <laughs> in Tokyo. And we had the same uh, Yamaha valve oil. We had the same mouthpiece. And Lou started doing that, that sort of like soft laugh. That <laughs> he started laughing like that. And I looked at him and I said, are you my paw? <laughs> and he, and he, 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 he 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 looked like he saw a ghost and we whenever we would see each other he would start laughing like that and it became it became a thing where like that's the only co conversation we would have was are you my paw and I, would <laughs> I would wait till he was really deep deeply involved in changing mouthpieces or really focused on something like that and I, sometimes i'd call him up at you know a reasonable hour and say, are you my paw? And just <laughs> listen to him laugh and laugh and laugh. But we became good friends and he's such a, a just kind, loving soul and one of a kind person and truly feel truly blessed to have known him. He's still a, he's still a hero, always will be. So yeah, thank right. you for inviting me to be a part of this. Yeah, you're right, Gizzy. Yeah, yeah, great, he is. great man. Great, Alex. Yeah. Yes, besides the New Balance and the T-shirt and the black shirt, the hairline is the same, too. <laughs> Absolutely. We had both gotten haircuts the day before, so <laughs> unbelievable. Okay, Alex, where are you at? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm so happy to be here. It's uh, almost like a dream. Anyway, um, I heard about Lou back in Soviet Union. I think he came to Moscow in 1989 with Amigos Epitaph. And uh, he became famous immediately. And uh, shortly I moved to the United States and he was one of the first person I met. And it's happened by accident. I was, sit I was sitting in with some band and he was having a dinner in a restaurant. And he, for some reason, he liked my play and, and invited me to sit in with the uh, <clears throat> 11th Orchestra in Sweet Basil, which they play every Monday. Uh, I appear next Monday to Sweet Basil. I play solo on uh, Rhythm Changes, and somehow I end up staying there regularly because of him. 
and um, after a couple of times playing sweet basil uh, he told me hey cp come come here when you're playing your eight notes it's not together it's not really together with the trumpet section, you kind of Russian. I said, well, I am Russian, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, uh, he took his time. I remember it's very clear. He took his time and uh, spent actually a couple of times, we spent some time together. He showed me how to articulate, how to practice, how to pay attention to the triplets, how to match the rhythm, uh, trumpet section, how, how to fill the drums. and everything became so clear i mean i couldn't I, I still couldn't play for some time but i, I knew what should i do to accomplish the, the next step and since this time i'm talking about 1991 we became very close friends with tour with george Grun's band we played in mingus band <clears throat> and at some point i was almost about to get married my first wife and we've been very close and for some reason he went to her parents dinner and said hey i heard your daughter married alex Tipagin. he's a good trumpet player and also he's a ladies man oh god i remember she immediately called randy, randy breaker hey who's this guy alex Tipagin, the ladies so it was kind of a big drama. And next week I saw him in the Mingus band and he immediately tell me, hey, Alex, I just saw you uh, future parents-in-law and I told him, you are a ladies man, which is good, right? I said, <laughs> I was so mad. He was exactly like Earl was describing it before. But anyway, you cannot be mad at Lou. It, it, it took me like a couple of hours and we became even closer friend. And one more little segment. I remember we did our last recording together. It was Robin Eubanks' big band. In, and Lou invited me to stay over in his apartment. And it was probably like a few months before he passed away. And he asked, Alex, before we go to my apartment, I want to go to the liquor store. And he asked the guy, what was the most expensive bottle of vodka in this store? And of course, guy shows it. Yeah, here's some uh, whatever, whatever it was, Grey Goose or whatever, Platinum, $250. Said, Lou, stop it, please, don't do this. And But he, he, he insisted and bought this bottle of vodka and we spent all night talking, playing some duos, and uh, you know, it was the most sweetest moment. I miss him very much. Yeah, you were. Sasha, if I may yeah. interrupt. I, I just remembered that he was quite passionate about wine, if I remember correctly. Yeah, <laughs> right. you know what? I was very surprised that he was having shot of vodka with me, which is uh, very, very unusual. <laughs> he was passionate about wine, but he never drinks those wines. He Lou was very passionate about wine, but he couldn't drink. Yeah. Well... <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm not making it up. Spent <laughs> thousands and thousands of dollars on great wines. I have a case of forty-seven Petrus. I have a case yeah. of nineteen sixty-one Latour. I have a case of this. I have, but he would have one glass, and that you'd be wobbly. <laughs> well, he had a few shots. Okay, we're going. That's what my. We're going to go over to Marcus <clears throat> print up now. I know somebody is going to talk about Lou and those mouthpieces. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I am. <laughs> hey, man, it's just, I was just thinking, just being in this group of all these great trumpet <clears throat> players and how, how cool it is just to be in this, um, this conversation. And just thinking about the last time that I was in such an aggregation that was at Clark Terry's funeral, and which is also the last time that I saw Lou Soloff. Um, many of us saw him because I think our – the band went on tour to Mexico or something like that next week. And um, yeah, it's just, just, right. just, yeah, just really good to see all y'all. And if I think about co-signers or just That's people right. that taught, yeah, just people that people that just taught you how to just how to have that trumpet etiquette, that trumpet section etiquette, you know, we, we know what that is and what that can be. 
Um, one was Marcus Belgrave, who we should do this for as well at some point. Marcus Belgrave and the other is Lou Soloff. I didn't get a chance to spend much time with him in the trumpet section, but the, the, the time I did was just beautiful. I remember just, you know, coming from Conyers, Georgia, little country boy, you know, and um, just being in the session, you know, Fattis, Soloff, Winton, I think Nicholas and Brian Kaiser, same time. And I remember playing a solo and I felt Lou just like looking at me the whole time. And I was so nervous. Like, man, why is he looking at me like this? Do I sound like crap? But he was checking me out. And after I played, he said, man, I love your sound. And I thought he was saying that just because he saw I was nervous, but he actually meant it. And, and you know, he was talking about church and about deacons and, you know, that, you know, that, that kind of moan that he wants to, to check out. I was like, wow. So, you know, just, you know, just being so humble and just being so accepting, of course, is training us just how to treat all the, you know, all, all the young trumpet players and musicians today. So that's because of Lou Soloff, man. And, um, I'll just tell one quick story. We got some great stories on here um, about the mob pieces. When we found out that Lou had passed away, we were in, I'm pretty sure we were in Mexico City. Yeah, and, Mexico. And we did, yeah, so <laughs> so um, I think Ryan had just had shoulder surgery. Gizzy was playing with us, playing Leave This, Kenny Rampton, who's next, Winton and myself. <clears throat> so for the encore, I did the entire day, we we're just balling. We we're just all sad, you know, so we got through the gig. And for the encore, um, the rhythm section played, I think we played the blues. Was it the blues we played, y'all? Blues, blues, blues and G. Blues and G. Blues and G, yep. We played the blues and G for Lou. So, you know, we did like a little dirge, and then trumpet section got in the front row and just played, you know, we just traded courses. So Wynn played, and then Greg played. Gizzy played a solo. He's playing, and then all of a sudden he takes his mouthpiece out, changes his mouthpiece. <laughs> we didn't know what he was doing until like, oh, he's being Lou. Ah, it, it was so funny. We just broke out with. So we we went from crying to laughing. It was beautiful. Then when then when, when I, it was my turn to play, I loosely put my 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 harmony unit in, so so it would fall on the ground when I played. It. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> so Lou all off, man, and um. One last thing I'll say about this, about section etiquette that he, that he taught me. I think it was a, maybe a few years before he passed away. He was he was playing with us, and there's one passage that he was having problems with. I think he had had some some chop problems that day, and on the gig when that part came up, he didn't play, and I kind of nudged him. He's like, <laughs> I was like, oh. So then afterwards he goes. If I were to have played, it would have sounded horrible. So the best solution is silence. <laughs> so Kenny, when you hear me laying, laying, laying out on my parts, I'm thinking about Lou. <laughs> God bless Lou Soloff, man. All right. Yeah, yeah, man. Hey, Kenny man. Man. Oh, 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 oh. Passing off to Kenny Rafton. Oh, hey, you got the plunger. <laughs> uh-huh. right. Take it out. All right. Well, man, um, thank you for doing this, Winton. It's, right. it's just so great to see everybody and hear all these stories. Um, first thing that comes to mind is something that I think Dave Taylor said at Lou's memorial was that Lou had a way of making everybody feel like they were his best friend. And I think we all pretty much felt that way with Lou. And I you know, sat and thought about that statement and why was it that way? And I, it's just because Lou was so open. He had such an open heart, man. He was always sincere. He was always completely for real. And even when for real was just being stupid, <laughs> you know, and he was just, he was the best man. And he kind of, he helped me out so much with my career personally, with give, helping give me confidence the way John was talking about how, how you gave Lou confidence. You know, if you say you can't do it, you can't do it. And Lou was that way with me when, when I started, I was playing lead with the, uh, the Mingus big band and I was really nervous about it. And Lou was so encouraging, man. I, I I, there's so many stories I could tell, but you know we're we're getting late here. But um, I remember one time, Lou comes in. We were playing at the Iridium with Amigas Big Band. I was playing playing lead, and Lou, Lou was late to the gig. And um, you know anybody who's played over the the, the newer Iridium knows you come down the stairs and you come into the club. So we had started playing. We're on the bandstand, and Lou comes into the club. I see him come in, see the door open. He comes in, and he's got his trumpet case and another bag with him and he's wearing all black and he's running behind 
uh, behind the audience, around the back, and, and, and coming around to the bandstand. And it's just like turmoil, you know, <laughs> running through the club. <laughs> and, you know, he stops in the back for a second and listens. And then it continues on. <laughs> and then he goes all the way around. And that's a tight bandstand. And he comes and he climbs, literally climbs over and around the drummer while we're playing to get to the music stand. <laughs> he gets his mutes out. He gets his, gets his mouthpieces out. And Lou, man, he always had at least five or six mouthpieces with him. He sometimes played three mouthpieces in one solo. You know, so he gets all his mouthpieces out, sets them all in a row on the music stand, has the music stand up. I put the music up for him already. He gets his, his horn out, his trumpet stand, gets everything set, gets up ready to play, and he's wearing these little glasses. And he takes his glasses off. He sets them delicately on the, very delicately on the music stand. Music stand comes crashing down, mouthpieces <laughs> flying everywhere. <laughs> of course. Uh, of course. Just Lou, man. But one other quick story I want to tell, man. I was on tour with him one time with uh, Dave Matthews' big band, the Manhattan Jazz Orchestra. Not Dave Matthews, the pop guy, the, you know, the, the piano player. I was wearing the captain, captain's hat. Lou, uh, Lou recommended me for that gig. Um, Ryan Kaiser had been in the band and couldn't make a tour, so Lou, Lou got me on it. And we were playing, Dave was very famous in Japan. So we were playing big concert halls all throughout Japan. I think this was in, was in Tokyo. Dave Taylor may have been on that tour. No, well, maybe, I don't know. Anyways, um, one of the tunes we were doing was a feature for Lou. It was Sing, Sing, Sing. But it was, you know, it was, uh, um, Dave Matthews did an original arrangement, kind of a quirky little arrangement on it. But he kept some of the original stuff. And one of the things that he kept was the duet, but, you know, with the trumpet and drums, you know, the Gene Krupa drum thing. I think the, guy, the drummer's name was Terry Silverlight. And Lou was playing the trumpet solo. So it was a big feature for Lou. So if we were playing in a concert hall where there were stairs going down into the audience, Lou would always go down into the crowd and play, play to the people, you know? And so this particular concert hall had stairs in the front, you know, but it was a huge hall. It was like two or three balconies, you know? So he, he goes, goes down to the audience playing his duet with the drums and goes in the audience, keeps going further and further back into the audience. And the further away from the bandstand he gets, the more out of time with the drums he gets. <laughs> so he goes all the way back to the back of the hall. All right, he's already in the, he's wow. way in the back, completely in another time zone playing, you know, and he's got a, a clip on microphone, you know, and the people are loving it. You know, the Japanese crowd, they're very conservative, um, reserved, um, very polite, but they, they were loving it. And Lou has the usher open the door. So he goes out the back of the, back of the hall, out into the lobby, still playing. We can still hear him loud, loud as day because he's got the wireless mic on. And then we hear a ding. And then the, the, start, the sound starts sputtering, going in and out. And we figured out Lou, Lou went into an elevator. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's just losing the wireless connection, right? So it's sputtering in and out, sputtering in and out. And everybody, the whole audience is looking around. The band is looking around like, where is he? What happened? And then all of a sudden, everything locked into place at the same time. The top balcony, I think there's a third balcony. The door flies open. The, 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 the wireless mic... Uh, gets back back into the system. You hear Lou playing, and out comes Lou through the door, playing is like Gabriel entering the room, and the crowd just goes crazy. Man, this is a Japanese crowd where they're usually very reserved, and people were jumping up in their seats, screaming and cheering for him. It was unbelievable, man. It was like the door flies open, and boom, there's Lou, completely out of time. <laughs> <With a drum. laughs> but it just didn't matter. And then he played the cue to set up the band to come back in, and the drummer went with him, and it it was just an amazing feeling to be in his presence, man. But I, I miss him every day, man. I love Lou so much, man. So thanks for doing this, Winton. Yeah, um, I think uh, Mikey is next, yeah? Hey. Thank you, Kenny. Yeah, yeah, man. Right, Kenny. Um, yeah I'll keep it short. Um, well, when I first came into town uh, in 99, <laughs> Lou, um, I studied with Lou when I was at the new school. And my first lesson, he lived upstate at that during that time, so I took the train to Metro North up there. He picked me up, and in the car, he was playing Sergei Nakarikov CD. <laughs> so he took me, we went back to his place, and we just sat in the driveway and listened to like you know three or four more tracks of the record. And he's like, "Man, this kid, oh man, he's unbelievable, right? He's just waiting <laughs> for Sergei, and it'll be unbelievable." So we get inside the house, and immediately we go to the basement, and and there's trumpet cases all over the place. <laughs> and so he's looking around. I'm just I'm holding my horn. You know, it's early in the morning, and he picks out this little tiny trumpet case, and he opens it up, and he pulls out this tiny trumpet, 
and it had a mouthpiece and everything. I thought it was a toy, but it was an actual trumpet. It might have been that same trumpet that Sergey was talking about. I think so. <laughs> he was tiny, and he's just like, "Here, play this." And I'm meeting him for you know first time. I pick up the trumpet. I couldn't make a sound out of this thing, you know. I haven't warmed up nothing. So he takes the trumpet from me and he and he just gives me. He goes, "You're not a natural trumpet player. You may be a natural musician, but you're not a natural trumpet player." And I was like, <laughs> oh, oh. And then he gave me one of the greatest lessons that I've ever had. Uh, we went back, we went upstairs to the living room, and he gave me a beautiful lesson that I'll, you know, I'll always cherish. Um, one more quick story. Years after, uh, well, actually, Lou was very instrumental in getting me um, into the scene and getting me to play with um, different, different uh, great, great gigs. You know, Carla Blay and, and 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 other 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 great gigs. And. Fattis, I don't know if Fattis remembers this or not, but he, he invited me to play with the Carnegie Hall Band and the trumpet section was Lou Soloff, Mike, Mossman, Jim Rotundi, and myself. We played at the, the New Orleans Jazz Festival. And during the time we rehearsed at the old carols and we were playing that tune, When You're Smiling. And John rehearsed it. He said, all right, I'm going to sing a chorus and then Lou, you're going to come up here and you're going to play the head out. And that'll be the end of the day. Cool. We rehearsed it that way, boom. Great. We go down to uh, New Orleans. We go to the, the festival. Blah, blah, blah. We're playing that tune. During during the, when Fattis was singing, I think he he called an you called an audible, and you said the audience is gonna sing one. But Lou was was getting ready for his big solo, so he was <laughs> he bent over and he grabbed the different trumpet, and John turned around and he said the audience is gonna sing one, sing a chorus. And so Lou gets up and he missed that cue. So he's getting ready to go up there, and John turns around. And he starts conducting the audience. What? And Lou comes in, pa pa. And Fatty said, "No!" <clears throat> and he hit Lou in the stomach. <laughs> Put that hand and, and reached out and gave him a chest twister. Right? Ah! He grabbed him here, and Fatty went, ah! <laughs> he hit him back, and then Lou was, ah! Oh, but and I swear to God, it was like two brothers hitting each other. <laughs> All the while, the audience was, and they're like hitting each other, like, oh, mm, mm. and then finally, after they did that puzzle, Luke came in and just brought the house down. And and I remember sitting back there, I was just like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm waiting to see this. This is one of the biggest moments of my life. And Pat was just like, oh my God. And Luke, uh, Luke was, oh, it's just so beautiful. It was oh, a great man, moment. Great, I, I mean, Luke, I love them. He loved trumpet players, like Wynton said. He, I mean, he loved everybody here and anybody who played the trumpet. And 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 we always love to remember him for for all our lives. Yeah. Thank you, Wynton. Yeah, you. yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah man. Yeah, you're right, Mike. Okay. I want to thank everybody. I don't know how much time we have left. I'm gonna just tell y'all a couple of things, a, a couple of stories, not long. One is I learned more watching John and Luke than I I had ever learned because uh. It's just the depth of the love and respect they had for each other. I'm not even talking about how great they played. We're cracking jokes about Lou. Yeah, he dropped things. He changed mouthpieces in between songs. But like John and like, 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 I mean, everybody on this call, but for me being the age I was and them being immediately older than me, the way that they were playing their horns was unbelievable. I went on a session with them once. They were reading everything. John was talking about he couldn't read. I wasn't used to reading all the time. I remember we played one session and John looked at me and said, man, you need to learn how to read. So <laughs> it's just the clarity they would play with. And then with Lou, it's just the love Lou had for John. It, it was so for real and it was in their playing, it was in, in how they rehearsed. And there was a manifestation of it, which was, 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 was clown and acting silly, which we, we, Trump, we like to have a good time and play. But <laughs> I think you got muted, Whitten. <laughs> yeah, they didn't, they, he didn't want me to say it. That's Adam mutes me sometimes. He doesn't want to hear me say these things. <laughs> but the playing, the playing was on such a high level of seriousness, and and for such a so long and so so absolutely you would take it for granted. And with Lou, he could play anything. He played classical music, jazz. He tried out the band that I had with my brother when I when I was eighteen or something, nineteen. He started playing with them before me. He could play modern, any kind of modern music, New Orleans music, swing era music. He had no prejudice about music and he would play the hell out of all of it. So I'm gonna just leave you with one story about him that says exactly how he was about music. One, one, day, one, one uh, 
concert at the New York Philharmonic, Phil Smith was playing and John went, a bunch of us who played trumpet went to that concert. Phil played the hell out of the Brandenburg. We were all sitting in a row. And Lou was just there, man, listen to Phil. Listen how Phil plays. Just anytime you would hear somebody, always so positive that you went home feeling good and you had more love just kind of of the instrument and music by being around him. But seeing kind of the vibe him and John had with each other and to see them as they grow, just that when, when we first heard that Lou had passed away, the first thing I thought was, let me call John. You know, when I got John on the phone, he, he, could, he couldn't say nothing. And it was just that silence had more emotion and feeling in it that is one of the kind of things I'll remember for my entire life because it was, it, it was the depth of something that's so human. That, you know, yeah, we joke around and we clown, but there's a thing underneath it that makes all of that stuff funny. And they, they embodied that for me. And Lou brought that out of all of us. Well, John, they, they, had, they had a thing. One, one, one day, Lou came to my house with a shofar. So he said, he, 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 he said, yeah, man, I was, I was up here. I was playing shofar. He said, uh, he said, you ever played shofar? I said, yeah, man, I, I, I opened the synagogue on Lexington Avenue. I have a shofar in another room. He said, really? Let me see it. So I went and got my shofar, and he had his, and he looked at mine, and we started playing. He looked at the mouthpiece. He said, this is an interesting mouthpiece. So we started playing these shofars. So I, it was like 6.15 or something in the, in the we start playing the shofars. And then we start looking at each other. And then some kind of way, we start to try to play blues on the shofar. <laughs> we start playing. Literally 25 minutes passed of us looking at each other, posing and stuff, playing shofars. <laughs> then Lou looked, looked at me after like 15 to 20, 25 minutes of it. He goes, what are we doing, man? <laughs> I said, man, I don't know, man. But that's how he was. He was about this music. So. We don't have time, I think, for, for questions or anything. I want to thank all of our guests. I mean, everybody's such a fantastic musician. And I'm so happy to have y'all tonight for this final one we're doing this. I could think nothing more uplifting than to talk about our great colleague and to allow, allow us to be in the service of music and our instrument and talking about it. He was something. And I, I hope that we always remember him and what he was about, what he represented, and what he taught all of us, and what he, what he meant to not just our instrument, but to musicianship and the collegiality that's a part of being us, and that we be in that spirit uh, as we go forward. So thank y'all very, very much. And Vincent, uh, yes. Vincent, one thing before you say goodbye, uh, Lou's daughter is here, Laura. And I don't know if, Laura, if you would like to say anything or, um, you know, she's Adam, here. You, you, can, For, can, you, can you get her up, Adam? Yeah, Laura, you should be unmuted. Okay. Hey, I'm Laura. Um, it was so good to be here. I feel like I can't talk for very long because I'm like, just needed to hear from my dad today, you know? And like, I'm very moved by everything that y'all said and um, miss him every day. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I get to hear him, like he lives on through you guys and his music. And it was really, a gift to be here so thanks thank you so much for being with us thank you john you want to take us out well you know with all of the the the, the covid 19 with all of the things going on going on with race relations uh with our lack of leadership <laughs> <laughs> lou was one of the uh, he's the only person I ever met didn't see color, didn't matter. You know, in his own way, he was very, very spiritual. You know, he practiced, uh, um, you know, his diet during the holidays and all that stuff. He took me to Moisha King to eat. Uh, I don't even know what that is. It's bad Chinese food that was kosher. But... <laughs> <laughs> First big band arrangement that I ever arranged was written for Lou and dedicated to him. And one of the things he used to always say when he would go to a restaurant and the food would be so-so, Dave Taylor knows this. He, Dave Taylor used to say, man, you burned me all the way through Europe, but you didn't say the game was fresh. <laughs> one of the things that Lou would always say is, this is the best I've found. And I... <laughs> wrote a piece for Lou called The Best I Found because he was the best friend that I'd found. 
So everyone, thank you, Wenton. Thank you for doing this. Thank your staff, Adam, Gab, Gabby. Um, you know, he was very special. Like I, I'm kind of responsible for his excessive use of mouthpieces uh, because <laughs> that you're playing a five C and you're trying to play up there. You're crazy. So I said, here, Lou, try this, and he tried some of my mouthpiece. Had some made. And then that was that was it. So he would he would switch mouthpieces in the middle of a phrase in us in a solo, and <laughs> but he would always do it gracefully, and it was always for the music, and that's the kind of man he was. Uh, he loved music. He loved the trumpet, um, but all of those that he helped myself, Randy, Kenny Rampton, Earl. Mike Rodriguez, Marcus, Winton, yeah. Sarah Giz. He loved all of you, yeah. or all of us. Right. Alex Sibia. Laura, you don't know how proud he was of you. Yeah. And Lena as well. And and one last thing I would say is Earl. Sir. Japan to you. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, I wanted to say Earl, Alvin Ailey, intermission, first two. Earl took a quart of water and poured it down Lou's trumpet. Lou had his trumpet on the stand. No, 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 three trumpets. And then he picked one up and just water going all over the Alvin Ailey. <laughs> he, had, he, had three, he had three trumpets. Why? But, I don't know. But he had three of them. We filled all of them up. But so, all up, and so when we came back, he, every time he picked up a trumpet, water would come flying out. <laughs> pick up the next one. He, he's, thanks. Pick up the next thanks. One. Okay. <laughs> Lou loved and was loved by all, and I miss him. Laura, you were very special, so was Lena. And um, thank you everyone for being there for Louis Michael Soloff. Right, yes sir. Thank y'all, Adam, you got it. It's great to see everybody. Thank you everybody. Really Randy. Um, just want to say thanks to Winton and to each one of our guests tonight. Um, you heard from John Faddis, Randy Brecker, Earl Gardner, Michael Rodriguez, Kenny Rampton, Marcus Kernup, Sergei Nakarayakov, Greg Gispert, Alex Sipiagin, and Dave Taylor. Um, and lastly, a big thank you to all of you for joining us tonight and for being here every week. Um, as I mentioned at the top of this show, tonight is our last episode of Skane's Domain um, before a two-month summer break. It's been a real pleasure being here with you guys every Monday night at 9, and we'll be back in September for more Skane's Domain. And finally, please do keep an eye out for the exciting new summer programs that we'll be launching in the meantime. You can find more information on our website at jazz.org, as well as on our social media channels. Um, and we'll see you around soon. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Winston. All right, guys. Thank you. All right, Joe. Bye-bye, everybody. Much love, respect. Thank you all so much. Okay. Man.